The dwarves are a race apart. Of their strange beginning, and why they are both like and unlike elves and men, the Silmarillion tells. But of this tale, the lesser elves of Middle-earth had no knowledge, while the tales of later men are confused with memories of other races. Though written about his fictional dwarves in the Lord of the Rings books, Tolkien's description of the race, being like and unlike elves, and their being confused with memories of other races, is a pretty apt description of dwarves in our world's folklore. These days, when you're talking about a dwarf in fantasy, your default is most likely the Tolkien version of the race. Short, stocky, bearded, probably wielding an axe, and most at home under a mountain or in a mine. As we'll soon see, these are traits that dwarves were considered to have before Tolkien came on the scene, but they're just a few of the ways the race was described. So let's dig into the history of dwarves and see if we can't unearth a few hidden gems about the origins of this hardy, and sometimes foolhardy, staple fantasy race. As I mentioned, J.R.R. Tolkien is largely responsible for the image of dwarves that you see in games and media today, but he didn't invent dwarves. And despite what some people think, he also didn't invent dwarves. No, I didn't just repeat myself, not exactly anyway. The proper English plural of dwarf is dwarfs. In what Tolkien called a piece of private bad grammar, he instead used the term dwarves throughout his work, as he put it, for special purpose and effect, and because it goes well with elves. And really, who can blame him? Besides elf and elves, English has plenty of nouns ending in F that have plurals that take V-E-S, so it's really a bit of a mystery as to why dwarf didn't naturally become dwarves. Dwarf is the English word that most closely resembles dwarf, and it can apparently take S or V-E-S for its plural, though I wonder which you would use if you duplicated a certain Klingon. But Tolkien wasn't the first to use the word dwarves. In 1916, while Tolkien was serving in World War I, Arthur Gilchrist Brodeur published his translation of the epic Norse mythological work The Prose Edda, in which he makes extensive use of the word dwarves. Tolkien was very familiar with the Prose Edda, as we'll later see, though we'll never know whether he read Brodeur's translation and borrowed his word, or if he possessed another version of the translation, one of which I found that uses dwarfs. Nor can we be certain that Brodeur was the first to use the term. Maybe the alternate spelling was popular for hundreds of years before. But it could have been worse. As Tolkien wrote in one of his letters, the real historical plural of dwarf, like teeth of tooth, is dueros anyway. Rather a nice word, but a bit too archaic. Still, I rather wish I had used the word duero. That form is actually used in his books once in Dwerodolf, one of the names of Moria. Though it's probably best that Tolkien went with the more common sounding dwarves. And for the rest of this video, that's a term I'll use. Whatever word we use to name them, one thing we can all agree upon is how a dwarf looks, right? Right? Norwegian professor Ugnius Mikuchionis, who wrote about the various contradictions in dwarven appearances in the various myths, summed it all up by saying, It may in principle be impossible to provide a single short answer to the question of what the dwarfs look like. He thinks that dwarves were often not labeled as such due to their physical appearance, but due to some other quality, like their personality or even color. The Norse sources describing dwarves are wide and varied, and none contain a full-fledged description of a dwarf, especially in the physical sense. Their descriptions change from story to story, or often go unmentioned. Sometimes they're even considered a kind of elf. And one of the names of the dwarf race, Svartalfar, literally translates to Dark Elf. Which, if you squint hard enough, you could imagine becoming a word like dwarf. It's possible that elves and dwarves have the same lineage, with the two splitting off at some point. Elves being considered a higher being that stayed close to the gods, with dwarves occupying a lower place, sometimes in the physical sense, underground or inside a mountain. One of the dwarves mentioned by name is Gandalf, yes, really, and that name translates to Wand Elf. Imagine telling these two that they share a common ancestor. Some myths or stories portray dwarves as incorporeal spirits or as extremely ugly. One 19th century writer drawing on that idea called them deformed little men with huge oblong heads and flat noses. So, with all that in mind, let's see if we can't pin down at least a few details regarding the appearance of dwarves. Let's start with the most recognizable feature of a dwarf, its height. The common word dwarf, meaning something or someone small, comes from Old English and is probably related to the Norse tales of mythological dwarves, though whether the term came before the fantasy creature or vice versa is unknown. In other words, was a short being of myth called a dwarf, and that term was thereafter used to describe anything small? Or did the word dwarf exist, and tellers of tales decided to use it to describe their short beings? For that matter, are dwarves even short at all? Many tales of dwarves make no mention of their height, 
and they're sometimes referred to with names that mean tall, though that might be a humorous name, sort of like calling a big guy tiny. Some dwarves could even change their shape, becoming very tall, and, as Professor Macuccionis said, it's possible that a dwarf, as presented in Norse myths, was given that label not because of its physical form, but because of its behavior. In the same way you might refer to someone today as small, not because of their physical size, but because of their pettiness, jealousy, or greed. All traits that are often assigned even to the good dwarves of Tolkien. The Norse Jotnar or Jotun, translated as giant, are also sometimes portrayed as being human-sized, lending further evidence to the notion that one size didn't fit all, at least when you're describing mythological dwarves or giants. Some dwarves also have names that evoke colors or hues, like Blover, meaning the shining one, Glowin, meaning glowing, or Leader, meaning colored. So it's possible that a dwarf's color and not his height marked him as a dwarf. Though it's also possible that these descriptors make reference to dwarven forges and their brightness, or in the cases of dwarves mentioned as dark in color to their being covered in suit from their work. What about beards? There's no mention in the Norse myths of dwarves having beards, but seeing as how they were considered common for our Norsemen of the time, it's possible that they were just given beards by later Christian writers due to their association with real bearded Norsemen. But do dwarf women have beards? The real question might be, do dwarf women even exist at all? In Tolkien's works, female dwarves exist but are rarely mentioned, and their absence mirrors some of the earliest dwarf myths which barely mention female dwarves. In one interpretation of the origin of dwarves, only two, both male, were made by the gods, and they populated the species crafting more of their kind, rather than sexual reproduction which would obviously be impossible. Dwarf mythology was laid out over hundreds of years, so several authors likely contributed to their descriptions, and as we'll soon see, it's not just dwarves' appearances that cover a wide range of possibilities. The earliest mention of dwarves comes from a series of runes carved on a skull fragment in the 8th century. It, and other early references, describes dwarves as being more like evil spirits than physical beings, invisible and causing harm to people. Remedies against the influences of evil dwarves include a lead plaque found near Fakenham in Norfolk, England, and instructions on how to deal with a disease-causing dwarf were part of a series of medical texts written about a thousand years ago. Against the dwarf. One must take several small wafers, such as are used for communion, and write these names on each wafer. Then next, the spell that is quoted hereafter is to be sung, first in the left ear, then in the right ear, then above the man's head, and then let a virgin approach and hang it on his neck, and let this be done in this way for three days. It will go better with him directly. Viewed in this light, dwarves are similar to other intangible or otherwise elusive little people, like gremlins or goblins or imps or leprechauns, who are often blamed for diseases or other unseen mischief. The 9th century poem Ying Lingatal provides one of the first mentions of a dwarf and its association with stone or mountains, as someone is seen running into a stone to chase a dwarf, where he's trapped forever. Several tales refer to a dwarf being encountered while standing next to a boulder, and their home is Nidavellir, one of the Nine Worlds of Legend, a subterranean maze of caves and mines. Nidavellir is also sometimes identified as Svardalfheim, which translates quite readily as Dark Elf Home. Another reference to dwarves is a kind of Dark Elf. A less beneficial tale linking dwarves in stone comes from the story of Alvis the Dwarf, who courted through the daughter of Thor. The Thunder God disapproved of his daughter being engaged to someone he compared to an ogre, and so he kept Alvis, whose name means All Wise, awake all night, asking him questions to prove his vast knowledge. When the sun rose and its light struck Alvis's flesh, he turned to stone, which should seem familiar to anyone who's read The Hobbit or seen its movie adaptation. Some have interpreted this tale as meaning that dwarves spend all their time inside mountains, and were thus adversely affected by sunlight. Thor even refers to Alvis as pale, which might be expected of someone who never sees the sun. As you might expect from beings who spend a lot of time surrounded by stone and precious metal, Norse dwarves were portrayed as being excellent crafters. A pair of dwarf brothers, Brock and Sindri, manufactured several wondrous items including Thor's hammer Mjolnir, the spear Gungnir, and Dropnir, the magic ring that replicates itself that I talked about in my video on magic rings. Their most wondrous, or perhaps just strangest creations were given to the god Freyr. These included Golden Bursty, a glowing golden boar that could fly, and the ship Skidbladnir, which goes wherever its owner wants and could be folded up small enough to fit in one's pocket. Lest you think making magic items like this is easy, here's a list of ingredients that went into Glipnir, an unbreakable chain used to restrain the great wolf Fenrir. It was made of six things, the noise a cat makes in footfall, the beard of a woman, the roots of a rock, the sinews of a bear, the breath of a fish, and the spittle of a bird. And though thou understand not these matters already, Yet now thou mayest speedily find certain proof herein, that no lie is told thee. Thou must have seen that a woman has no beard, and no sound comes from the leap of a cat, and there are no roots under a rock. 
In other words, these things are now unheard of because the dwarves used all of them that existed to forge Glipnir. So the notion of dwarves as mountain-dwelling craftsmen is firmly established in the Norse myths, but one thing you don't hear about is their skill in battle. For that, we have to go a little farther ahead. In the current day, we tend to view dwarves as great warriors, typically swinging an axe and showing great strength and fortitude. Four Norse dwarves with the names Ostri, Vestri, Nordri, and Sudri are said to be strong enough to hold up the sky. Their names translate as the four cardinal directions, east, west, north, and south. Other than that, however, Norse sources don't tend to portray dwarves as particularly strong or brave. Medieval German tales picked up that slack a few centuries later. Probably the most famous warrior dwarf of that period is Alberic, anglicized as Oberon, who's mentioned in the Nibelungenlied, an epic German poem written about 1200. He's described as bold and savage and a sturdy dwarf, though he's still conquered by the hero Siegfried, becoming his servant and guarding his treasure hoard. When Siegfried comes in disguise to claim the hoard, we get a pretty good description of Alberic's appearance and the battle between the two. Full wroth was Alberic and strong enow. On his body he bare helmet of rings and mail, and in his hand a heavy scourge of gold. Swift and hard he ran to where Siegfried stood. Seven heavy knobs hung down in front, with which he smote so fiercely the shield upon the bold man's arm that it brake in parts. The stately stranger came in danger of his life. From his hand he flung the broken shield and thrust into the sheath a sword, the which was long. He would not strike his servant dead, but showed his courtly breeding as his knightly virtue bade him. He rushed at Alberic, and with his powerful hands he seized the gray-haired man by the beard. So roughly he pulled his beard that he screamed aloud. The tugging of the youthful knight hurt Alberic sore. So this dwarf at least had a beard. As I said previously, Norse dwarves weren't known for having beards, but the dramatic dwarves of the Middle Ages were, probably due to them being a stand-in for actual Norsemen. It's likely that, just as with beards, the concept of Norsemen as strong warriors was transferred to their creations, the dwarves, long after marauding Vikings were no longer a problem for mainland Europeans. The savage Alberic is conquered by the good Christian knight Siegfried, just as the Norse pagans were converted to Christianity. Even Siegfried himself was based on a Norse hero from the sagas. Along similar lines is another Germanic tale, the poem Loren, which also dates to the early 1200s and relays the tale of the hero Dietrich von Bern and his scuffles with the dwarf king Loren. Dietrich's man tramples Loren's rose garden, which draws out the wrathful dwarf king, who is splendidly armed and armored. He also has three magic items, a belt that grants him incredible strength, a cap that can make him invisible, and a ring with the stone of victory, whatever that means. Dietrich manages to pry all three items from Loren and defeat him, after which the king welcomes Dietrich and his men into his palace inside a mountain, only to drug them, imprison them, and sentence them to death. They escape with the help of Loren's queen, who is the sister of one of Dietrich's companions. There are different versions of the story, including one in which Loren becomes Dietrich's jester, a role that was often filled by actual dwarfs. As you can now tell by the numerous tales and varied descriptions throughout the ages, it's impossible to say that there is one definitive image of a dwarf. The dwarves of the Lord of the Rings have become the standard, but, as with any creator taking inspiration from folklore, Tolkien picked and chose what parts of dwarven myths he decided to incorporate into his race. Most of the traits he selected have been typical of dwarves in fantasy ever since, and they do generally mimic many of the established attributes of dwarves in myth. But even Tolkien admitted that they weren't the same, saying that his dwarves were not quite the dwarfs of better known lore, and not really Germanic dwarfs. Sometimes all it takes is one creator to crystallize a diverse concept into a definitive form that becomes the common trope going forward. It's sort of like how Barbarian is now synonymous with the depiction of Robert E. Howard's Conan, how the disparate King Arthur myths coalesced thanks to Geoffrey of Monmouth, or even how the writings of Julius Caesar 2000 years ago shaped many of our impressions of druids. Maybe that narrows our views of these complex myths, but a wealth of contradictory folklore leaves room for another enterprising creator to carve out a niche for his or her version, by taking a seemingly familiar concept and making them their own, feeding and advancing the evolution of the myth. Who knows? In, let's say, 40,000 years or so, dwarves might take on very different forms in ways that the ancient Norse scalds could never have imagined. Thank you so much for watching this video about dwarves. This one was a little bit of an experiment that I intentionally made a bit longer by including more details, so let me know what you thought of it, and if you'd like more videos like this going forward. And please like and subscribe if you want to learn more about the true history of fantasy. Until next time, don't be like Alvis. Go outside and get a little sunlight and fresh air. It won't turn you to stone, I promise.